then I was uh, still like very, very naive. Spencer was less naive. And for example, he pushed me to apply for faculty positions uh, literally like two weeks after I had arrived uh, to Bloomington. So I wonder, Spencer, why did you want to get rid of me like so quickly? <laughs> Okay, but back to Spencer. So Spencer asked me to keep this introduction like very short, but I still want to mention that Spencer received several different fellowships and prizes, including also awards by students for his like outstanding uh, teaching skills. And uh, he was awarded several NSF uh, grants in the section of community ecology, and he published many must read papers for uh, ecologists. And what I'm often amazed about, Spencer, when I read your papers, is that you uh, so like nicely combine this mathematical modeling with collection and processing of empirical data. So what Spencer does is that he develops a theory and then he designs experimental studies, lab studies, and also field data collections of natural populations to test these theories. So Spencer, I'm really curious, like tell us why should we study parasites? Okay, that does not work. Don't. Okay. That was such a nice introduction. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me to come share why we should study freshwater disease. So this is work done with former and current students. Many, much of it's older work. And so I've had this pleasure of going back and thinking about what I did with Dave, Marta, Rachel, Alex, Jess, and Turner still in the lab. And it just brought so many good memories of, of doing this work with them. So it's, it's been awesome to do that, uh, think through it in this talk. Okay. So, yeah. So... I want to try to convince you to think about freshwater parasites in your work. And, um, but first, I have to acknowledge that most, we, we know many terrestrial examples because they're so sexy, right? Um, hippos with anthrax, chlamydia epidemics and koalas, think about it. Deer wasting before your eyes. Um, uh, Ebola wiping out gorillas. Um, coronavirus affecting homo sapiens. Um, oozing trees. All of it's still amazing and so obvious. But freshwater examples abound. So we have uh, ooh, viral fish. We have um, plague and crayfish. We have frogs dying. <laughs> we have worms infecting humans. We have fish deformed. We have um, eye, infections in eyes. So all of these examples in freshwater parasites suggest that we should probably be on this, right? But it's kind of remarkable. Like, Fresh, I would say freshwater ecology is not um, um, really at the advent of developing theory for disease. And, and many people here do awesome work on it, but it's just, it's just striking to me. Um, and I get it, okay? Freshwater ecology has changed a ton, and uh, many of what you're doing reflects it, and it's awesome. I like this survey um, done of papers from about when I was a PhD student to about now. It was looking at ASLO, not SIL abstracts, or Web of Science articles. But the, the point of this review paper was to show that many topics like methane and global issues and climate and rivers are becoming much more frequent. Um, and issues like involving organisms, and particularly plankton, are becoming much less frequent in our publications. And, and I get it. We want to solve the world problems. We're part of it, and we want to do solu have solutions, right? But it's, just, but it's just been striking to me. I've been working on disease things for about 20 years now. And um, there's strikingly little focus on disease and freshwater systems. And I, I just found that surprising because some of the major community modules that have influenced, certainly in my thinking, come from or popularized by freshwater ecologists. Think about like resource competition, you know, two competition for, between two species for two resources. It was popularized by someone who started off being a, a plankton ecologist. Trophic cascades, uh, some of the best examples of the effects of predators on grazers releasing resources come from lakes. 
um, issues of inedibility, diamond food webs. I still go back to Jim Grover's resource competition book, a lot of which was influenced by aquatic examples. And then eco-stoichiometry, a bread and butter of my dissertation, I was heavily influenced by Tom Anderson's book, for instance. But, you know, there's tons of others, like uh, alternative stable states and um, um, stage structure. Aquatic ecologists have been leaders in developing modules for how species interact with each other in non-parasite systems. I'm just wondering if we can be a bigger help in creating those modules for disease now. Okay. So the proposition, right? Could we envision a future in which, when we look at the major models of freshwater, um, could we interweave parasites like, much more thoroughly than we do? And could aquatic ecologists be the leaders in developing the disease modules that will appear in the community textbooks in the future? Like the things you hand to your new grad students in your lab, you say, read this, and e aquatic ecologists were the leaders in that, like we have been. I think aquatic ecologists can understand and predict the implications of epidemics through our approach to science better than a lot of, or in a way that would make many terrestrial ecologists jealous. Um, but uh, let's see if we can approach that today. So here's what I want to do. I want to take those two ideas. Can we incorporate disease into frameworks, and can we lead? And um, I want to think about that um, by approaching it in a several parts. First, I want to just tackle some of the big header le levels of heterogeneity that, if you're going to do it and help me out with this, I would invite you to think about. I want to motivate then, using a plankton example, some progress I've been making over the years in developing this myself, but I'm lonely, I want help. And then I'll show how I can use leverage that plankton system to gain insights into disease spread by focusing on trait links between environment traits and epidemics through gains and losses. And I only have time for one trait modification, if that but I've done a lot of others, which I'll summarize. And then I'll just leave you with some parting thoughts. Oh, yeah, you ready? Let's do this. Okay, so heterogeneity first. Okay, so where do we start? You're going to help me develop the community modules of disease of the future. So here's another proposition. If we could focus and identify those core heterogeneities, then maybe we can um, shape the structure of the modules that we'll develop. So I want to introduce you, just quickly review, epidemiological heterogeneities, intraspecific heterogeneities, thinking about host, which I do a lot. I'm a host. Um, and food web heterogeneities, uh, things that I compete with or eat me. So um, if I could do that and build the modular structure, then I could figure out how to connect environment to trait to the com components of the gains and losses of that structure that then allow me to make predictions about disease epidemics, why they go up, why they go down, and what they do in ecosystems. And then if I, if I can do that, then I can harness aquatic ecology's traditional approach of combining observations, experiments, and models. Uh, and many of you are awesome at doing all of those. All right, so what are the major sources of heterogeneity? First, um, the first obvious one is the epidemiological heterogeneity. This is the one that bewildered me when I first started working on disease work. But I think a starting point is to take a base, baseline model in which I have a susceptible, imagine I have a susceptible host and it's being consumed, uh, it's consuming, sorry, consuming a resource. And we have births and deaths and supplies and losses in, in, in ways that's like all of y'all's bread and butter, right? And then on top of that, we can layer in infection where inf hosts become infected by transmission of a parasite, and then they can give birth, they can consume resources too, they can die, etc. right? So there can be immune clearance. This focus on resources as the base of the module, I think, is something that aquatic ecologists could really make pronounced, because a lot of the organisms we study have such strong interactions with their resources. It's really different from disease models that come from a tradition of human work. Okay, but that's maybe not enough, right? So maybe you need to add in, you're thinking about your system, you need to add in, like, uh, for instance, an exposed class. Um, so uh, uh, algal resource is eaten by a susceptible host, and then the host enters into an exposed class before it becomes infectious, and that exposed class could have immune clearance. Yeah, so many hosts and ecosystems could be exposed. Um, for instance, Tara Stewart shamed me in my own system. She showed me data il illustrating, like, dude, 
all of your hosts at some times can either be showing and creating infectious propagules to the system you'll see in a second, or they're going into in the future, they're infected, like all of them. And I had no idea because I wasn't thinking about the exposed class. Okay, but that's not enough. Like a lot of aquatic parasites have heterogeneities like they make in environmental propagules. This is going to be important today. So um, I have this resource, susceptible host, infected host, but infected hosts make environmentally distributed propagules. So these propagules go out to the environment and the parasite's hoping that they'll be eaten or otherwise contact susceptible hosts to keep the epidemic going, but infected hosts may eat them. And very importantly, life is perilous in the environment for a propagule of a parasite. It can be lost through a bunch of sources. You, you'll see what I mean as I give you some examples. So many parasites spread environmentally in aquatic systems. I mean, they're being talked about at this meeting too. Viruses, bacteria, non-modal modal things, et cetera. So, okay. And, and there's all kinds of other examples of heterogeneities of epidemiology. I just had to cut it for time's sake. Um, just because there are some key epide uh, heterogeneities at the host level that will influence where we're going. So the first one I'm not going to go to, but I can't believe hasn't been developed. I mean, like by me, for instance, like because um, my bread and butter as a grad student was to make stoichiometrically express, explicit consumer resource models and, and test them. So I have an, an algae or an autotroph that has carbon and made of carbon and nitrogen. So is the host. And, you know, it, uptake of nutrients and there's nutrient recycling, like things that aquatic ecologists know well. We can layer on infected hosts that make propagules and work in the nutrient recycling implications of infection into these models. And it, this largely remains to be done, anyone interested? Um, it's a bridge between epidemics and nutrient recycling that I think could be really, could be really awesome. But there is stage structure. To, I'm currently thinking a ton about this. Uh, a stage structure heterogeneity in which adult hosts compete with juvenile hosts for food um, and are linked through birth and development processes. And layer on top of that disease here just of adults. But disease can then change those interactions, that competition for food, that the total production of births, et cetera, in ways that can modify stage structure by changing uh, symmetries and asymmetries of interactions between juveniles and adults. Finally, there can be genetic variation. I think about this a lot, too. All of those little those like circles you see, those are all genotypes. And those genotypes vary in their consumption of resources, but also their abil ability to be infected. And then that means that parasites, in this sort of heterogeneity level, can mediate host evolution. They do. Diversity issues, eco-evolutionary feedbacks, et cetera. Finally, there are... Uh, so it's possible that feedbacks through these within host heterogeneities deeply connect host issues of within host composition and structure to disease in ways that we still need to keep working on. Finally, there's heterogeneities at the food web level, and you're going to see an example of this today too. So I got this disease system right. I got this host that's eating a resource and making propagules, but those, that, that whole system has a competitor. And that competitor eats food bad. That competitor, so the competitor eats your food, but also eats your parasites. So is that competitor good or bad? Um, what do you think? Uh, diluter competitors can reduce disease, but also re reduce your density. Is it worth it? Um, and maybe alter situations of coexistence. So predators can, so there's that disease system again, and then predators can do all kinds of things. Like I don't, I won't tell you about today, but I work on a lot. So they can selectively prey upon infected hosts. They can sloppily release parasite propagules, which I think is best characterized by this awesome cartoon of a chaos ripping open Daphne and spreading propagules. Look at the terror of that Daphne. Um, and, but they do other things, right, too. Uh, and so predators can either inhibit disease epidemics or spread them. Um, and I'm working on through modules of that myself right now. Okay, finally, resource heterogeneity. I think this one's like really underdeveloped, but you all in particular might be interested in ways in which a disease system, like I have a, a resource, a susceptible host, an infected host, is using a nutrient to fuel all that business. 
but then there's an inedible resource, say like a, something causing an algal bloom. Um, I'm super curious, can disease of grazers modulate the, that interaction, or can the algal blooms modulate the disease interaction? I really think they can. I'm writing a grant about that right now. I'll, I'll let you know, and if it fu gets funded about it later, probably won't get funded. So, okay, so I focus a lot on intraspecific and food web heterogeneities myself. The rest of the story is going to involve harnessing those heterogeneities, connecting them to environmental factors through traits that either increase or decrease disease epidemics and harness the traditional model, experiment, observation approaches that have been, like, that were shown to me by aquatic ecology. Okay, so we're going to do this in a plankton system. All of this hot community ecology of disease actions happening in a plankton system. And so um, in the pelagia, imagine this. Um, you're in this pelagic environment of small north temperate lakes. And I'm um, in the Midwest of the United States. And um, you're, so you come to work with me, and I tell you you're going to go work in mine, uh, lakes that are 100 years old, formed in mines. Um, it's so cool. No, they're not that bad. Um, these strip pit lakes are from the basis of most of our observations, and they act a lot like normal natural lakes. Which, of course, we sample from rowboats. That's old technology. And kayaks, that's new technology. Okay, so we're out there, we're sampling disease epidemics. It's the most awesome part of the job, except Marta and Kelly get to do it, not me as much anymore. And so there's this Daphnia disease system. So there's our beautiful susceptible host. She's Daphnia dentifera, major grazer of algae in the open waters of these lakes. And she's infected by a fungus, this um, not drawn to scale. So those are propagules of the fungus, needle-like they're um, lost through the environment, but then they can be consumed through exposure. That's the exposure process. And if infection could happen or might not, but if infection happens, Daphnia bodies fill up with about, I'm trying to imagine this, half of my body weight is being filled in all my cavities by needle-like spores before I die and release the spores to the environment. That's, that's the life of an infected Daphnia. So... Um, so resource, algal resources fuel all that. And of course, algae varies in quantity and quality, like aquatic ecologists know a lot. So that's the disease system, and embedded in that are that ET-looking thing is Cereodaphnia. It eats spores and eats resources. I'll show you a story about that. And then there are predators like Hyoboros and fishes, which I won't get to talk about, that do all kinds of like, awesome things, um, which is mean to me to tell you, because then I'm not going to tell you about it. Okay, so we're going to take this system, all of that is all there, all interacting in the open water of these lakes. And I always like going back to this, this, these, these epidemics that I was surveyed. These were my first epidemics. I, I didn't have children. Um, I didn't, no offense um, to my children. I didn't have like my, the pressures of my job and I didn't have a mortgage. I was just out there in a robo and I was sampling these disease epidemics in these three lakes, triangle, square, and circle lakes. And what do you notice? Well, you notice that the disease, epi oops, sorry. The disease ep epidemics start in August, and they peak around my birthday in late September, and then they start to decline as the lakes get cold, okay? And so, like, for a given lake, we might characterize the peak prevalence of infection. Okay, so this Daphnia population at peak prevalence has 40% of them are infected with a fungus that's going to kill them and spew spores out into the environment. And so peak prevalence or area under the curve as epidemic size, you'll see both in, in this talk. I'm, I'm kind of naughty and switch between them. Okay, so then, um, so those observations, those patterns that come from the surveys form the basis of the questions. That I, I, I wouldn't know how to ask these questions without observing patterns in nature. There's Dave in a rowboat sampling them. Um, and then I use models to help me think through why do I see those patterns, parameterize those models with uh, experiments in the lab, and test them in both the field and the lab. But really, like, it's the interplay between the three that help me. I'm not particularly good at any of them, but it's the interplay that helps underlie most of our work. Okay. And so um, I can translate all the natural history of the disease epidemic into models like this. This is just an example. There's no test on this, don't worry. I just want to give you a flavor for like how I go about thinking about this. So I got a susceptible host. I have an infected host. I have, what's next? 
property duals, yeah, and then a resource. And, and the differential equations just track the gains and losses. And again, I'm, I'm not a mathematician or anything. I'm just a fuel biologist. But these help me think. So I got change in susceptible hosts through time. So I have births, and that's from foraging and conversion efficiency. I have deaths. That's from a background rate and predation, say, like, that's aquatic ecology 101. And then I layer on top of that infection. I have exposure. I have, OK, I ate a spore. How easily do I get sick from it? And then I have births from infected hosts, which may be reduced by foraging reduction. I'm, I'm infected. I, I eat more slowly, and I make fewer babies even on top of that. But I may have cleared infection and returned to the susceptible class. I'm infected. Uh, I, I'm infected, so I move from there to there. And then I die at some rate that's increased because the parasite kills me. Or I cleared infection, yay. Or um, I was eaten by a predator. And theta greater than 1 would mean that the predator likes to eat me, the infected host, more than a, a healthy host. And propagules, OK? So they increase. Again, there's no test on this. But propagules are released. And that yield may depend upon algal resources. And predators may release them if gamma is greater than 0. And then they're lost. So spores out of this parasite out in the environment are eaten by hosts. This is important. They're eaten by diluters for one of the modules. And then this is important. They're killed by environmental things like radiation you'll see in a bit. And then resources, you know, the production, like whatever that function is, that's like what you all, many of you study. And then there's consumption by hosts and by diluter competitors. So again, the point isn't like, this is the model. It's just an example. And I tend to make them more or less complicated to do the next step. So the next step is to think about, well, what drives epidemics? What makes them bigger? What makes them smaller? And those models can um, lead to indexes like we all know about or not now. That's all we thought about. That's all I thought about during the Cronus epi coronavirus epidemic. In humans, can the parasite invade? Am I going to die? R0 greater than 1 leads to a big epidemic. It's often correlated with the size of the epidemic. And R0 is cool because it creates ratios of gains and losses. Gains and losses, OK. Gains from release of propagules from the parasite's perspective, not your perspective as the host. From the parasite's perspective that wants to devour you, um, it Release of propagules, loss of propagules in the environment. Gains of new infection, loss of new infection. OK, so this is like a, a way in which we can take measurements of traits. Those identify the key traits and gains and losses. And we can link environment to them to make predictions. So environments influence disease by those traits that govern the gains and losses in that sucker. And then if we can parameterize those traits as functions of environment, we can make predictions. And the, and the model can help us resolve like when environment pulls one trait this way and the other trait that way, like in ways that my mind by itself can't resolve. OK, so let's take a model, so a, a suite of models like that, and just think through some gains and loss stories. Um, the first one will involve a focus of an environmental factor on a gain. And the punchline is stimulation of host growth through host condition can lead to larger epidemics. Now, I didn't see this one coming. Dave Civitello um, showed me that epidemics in lakes with more potassium lead to become larger. So there was the initial field pattern, um, average epidemic size versus potassium concentration increased pattern. So Dave then showed that, first of all, Daphne are often pho uh, phosphorus, potassium limited. But the reason why potassium increases gains is that um, they can influence growth of hosts. It's just an example of one of many ways that this happens. So increasing growth of hosts increases parasite yield and host reproduction. So the evidence, Dave takes animals puts them into water from a low uh, potassium lake, and then adds different levels of potassium and measures growth rate of juveniles, like how, how good is the Daphnia doing? Paras increases. Parasite yield per host infected increases. An index of reproduction, that's birth rate minus death rate over birth rate, don't ask. It just is part of the r not calculation, increases. So he does this for a bunch of different other traits, too. Pulls it all together into an R0 prediction. 
and the prediction, you know, bootstrapping over all of the different sources of nasty error, we predict that epidemics should be larger in lakes with more potassium. Um, which, uh, so potassium should stimulate epidemics. Uh, don't ask me about that one because it's off the charts, right? So, um, so then Dave tests this in a bag experiment. It was pretty, it's always fun setting these up. Um, these are, you know, one meter de- uh, wide rafts, eight meters deep, and a lake that has low f- uh, potassium. And Dave tracks total prevalence or adult prevalence below it through time. And then on the right-hand side, we'll just see temporal averages. So adult prevalence, okay, the, the black is the p- potassium added. The black is potassium added. The white is just normal control. And Dave shows that potassium addition stimulates epidemics. So when we go and try to understand why are there larger epidemics and leaks with more potassium, then um, the answer could, is likely because potassium stimulates host growth, leading to more parasite production, leading to larger epidemics. So this, this whole thing that I'm not convincing you of potassium limitation, it's just one example of many different things that we've tried to capture in a variety of different ways in which we call the host condition hypothesis. I've tried to capture the essence of that in Deb theory. Um, and the idea is hosts eat food and convert that energy into paying maintenance costs, making babies, growing, and not dying. And um, parasites mess with that by stealing that energy and influence all of those fluxes. And so I've used Deb-like theory or simpler versions of it to think through a whole bunch of things, like why does resource quantity or toxins or resource quality influence disease epidemics? How can we understand life history strategies of parasites? What are the key genotypes that, uh, key trade-offs among genotypes that either exist or change with resource quality? Predator carolines, et cetera. I, I really thought as an ass- assistant professor that I was going to be like the Deb theory um, parasite guy, but I couldn't get any of those grants funded, and I just moved on. Uh, does that happen to you at all? Uh, yeah. Anyway, so I still think this is really cool, and we're working on co-infection models of in, adding in immunity to this, this, this framework. Um, but, but that's not the only story, right? So another gain can involve infectivity. And the punchline of this little nugget will be that warmer temperatures can create larger epidemics through infection infectivity process, not through parasite production. And this is work done by Marta Schockett. So this, the first, we start with a pattern in lakes. There's Marta sampling. Um, so she shows that the temperature at the start of the epidemic, the epilimnetic temperature at the start, correlates positively with how large epidemics get. The different symbols are different years and stuff, but the, point, the pattern's pretty constant. So then Marta takes individuals in the lab over a temperature gradient and measures all the key traits in the gains and losses, right? And concludes that the issue now is that temperature increases transmission rate, not production of parasites. So um, the curve going up is increase in transmission rate with temperature, that flat, humpy thing that's not a lot happening. That's parasite production, the star of the previous story. So high temperature increases exposure, and it makes each individual spore more infectious, whereas temperature seems to decouple host growth from parasite growth, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so then Marta um, pulls all together all the different measurements into, again, a measure of r naught, and predicts that warmer temperatures should stimulate epidemics, the predictions in the solid line with 95% confidence intervals on the, on the, on the gray. So, um, and again, that's because of decreased exposure and infectivity. And then she tests these in mesocosms for several generations. The left will be the model prediction, the right will be the mesocosm. So we get the qualitative thing right. Orange is hot, 23 degrees, green is medium, 18 degrees, blue is cold, 15 degrees. Um, and then the experiment has larger epidemics when it's hotter, medium-sized epidemics at medium temperature, and smaller epidemics when it's colder. So yes, warmer is indeed sicker, although we can still work on making our models be quantitatively better, I admit. Okay, so what are we learning so far? 
Well, by focusing on the gains, environmental factors like nutrients, temperature can alter the key traits that then stimulate um, gains of parasites. And, and we can have mechanisms for that. We can do that, e aquatic ecologists. And, and that's cool because then we can also experimentally test them and kind of cinch it all together to explain epidemic size in nature. So I want to propose to you that this focus on environment trait epidemic links, we are capable of making those connections to then predict, for instance, will a warmer world be sicker? And if so, what's the, what are the core traits behind that? But that's not it, of course. <laughs> um, there are also losses of parasites that we should think about. And the punchline of this little nugget will be that browner can be sicker. So um, the observation we had in lakes to begin with was that, um, so I have an index of brownness. X-axis is, is UV transparency. So just think bigger numbers mean browner water versus the start date of epidemic or maximum prevalence. So epidemics tend to start earlier in browner waters and grow bigger in browner waters. And, and more years of sampling have firmed up those patterns nicely. This was just the first one. And one mechanism involves direct effects of solar radiation on parasite propagules in lakes. And we've done this a bunch of different ways. We put um, parasite spores in wheels and nuke them with UV. We've done incubations in the field, et cetera. This is one of my favorite first experiments. We incubated spores in little vials at the end of these little cool things, hung them from lakes at different depths. So depth, deeper means darker. So two different lakes that are clear. Depth, again, depth means darker, means uh, higher depth means darker. And we either wrap the parasites in, uh, in something that blocks all radiation, so that's the control, allows PAR but not UV, that's the dashed, and then add UV, that's the solid white symbol. And so you see a control, and then PAR light decreases infectivity, and then radiation can often finish off the job. UV can often finish off the job. That was in one lake. We see a similar pattern in the other. So PAR light and UV together can potentially really constrain um, epidemics in nature. But browning could release parasites from that. Well, um, the problem is that light, of course, you all know this, light has a bunch of different other uh, things that it does in ecosystems. I don't pretend to get, have all the answers today, but radiation can relate to habitat structure, like things like refuge size and stratification strength that then influence community players, that then influence disease. We, we tried, Rachel and I tried to put this together in a kind of like a flowy conceptual model. Again, there's no test on this. The thing I wanted to just emphasize is that indices of light penetration can directly influence epidemic start date and directly influence epidemic end date. But then there are these pathways like that one where light penetration leads to stratification strength that leads to predator density that leads to epidemics too. And, so far, I have no idea which pathways are more important, which may mean that I won't be able to predict if browner is sicker without understanding those, but I'm working on it. Okay, so um, finally, that issue brings up, um, it, that, that last example it brings up the idea that epidemics can erupt while embedded in food webs, and species interactions can catalyze or inhibit disease spread. And I just wanted to bring up one example with the ET-looking seriodophnia. So... There she is. She's a diluter competitor. And the dilution effect, by the way, is this huge issue in disease ecology, but it's one of these things that there are more like nature papers with broad region global patterns and more review papers than there are actual good models and good experiments. That sounds snarky. So um, I think there are two mechanisms here by which dilution can work. E.T., serodophony can eat spores and also eat food. Direct spore removal and lowering host density, both of which would reduce disease, um, but through different ways. And so the idea in Alex's dissertation was um, started from this observation that a key habitat structuring force, refuge size, so if you're a large-bodied plankton like Daphne, you need a refuge to hide in from fish predators during the day. Um, so 
systems with large, small, sorry, smaller refuges have higher proportion of predators. And so smaller refuges, more predators of spores are these diluter competitors. The reviewers made us call it uh, spore predators. Um, so smaller refuges lead to more diluters, and then more diluters lead to smaller epidemics. So the x-axis now is pre- frequency of these diluter competitors. The y-axis is how big epidemics are, and we see a decreasing pattern. Okay, so causation or correlation, people. These are field patterns. I don't know. Maybe it's all about predators. Well, so Alex then takes the system into the lab and parameterizes a mathematical model and makes predictions that he tests. So we have three different clonal genotypes of Daphnia, and, and Daphnia intraspecifically varies so much that you can do amazing things with them. So left ca- column model prediction, right column mesocosm results. First case, okay, the, the mathematical model predicts and the data show that dilution bombs. So the solid line is no diluter, no ET. Positive, the, sorry, the dash line is with ET. Both cases, epidemic so big, dilution fails. In fact, the diluter gets, starts getting sick through something called spillover. So it didn't work. Um, then there's the dilution success example. Again, the model predicts the solid lines without the ET diluter. The, posit- the dash line is with the diluter. The model predicts and the data show that dilution can work. The species can reduce disease prevalence. But there's a density cost. And finally, in the last case, the epidemics may be so small anyway because the host is so resistant that the diluter didn't matter. All it did was take food from your precious Daphnia host in this irrelevance condition. So I don't know. Um, Maybe in the field, the dark green middle row is what's happening and the extremes don't happen. I don't know why traits should be like that. I don't know if that's true, but that's what the experiment shows. The experiment shows that dilution can happen. Um, It just doesn't have to. Okay, so what do we... Oh, um, so we're still developing theory like this. For instance, along competition versus enrichment gradients. We're, We're in the process of this right now, making bifurcation diagrams in which we can map out the system's too depauperate to even have a host, or it has a host but no disease, or it has disease but no competitor, or it has that sweet spot of dilution competition, or only the competitor because the competitor displaces everyone else. Um, and we're explaining that with minimal resource requirements that aquatic ecologists have helped popularize, but we're in the process of still developing this module ourselves. Okay, so summary part two. Where are we seeing thus far? Well, we're seeing uh, the, a focus on losses. Browning and solar radiation can damage parasites directly, but it, and maybe it'll unleash epidemics, but the indirect effects are hard to know. Can algal blooms and cascade shield parasites? I'm really interested in that idea. I don't know if you can tell. Um, but then we have losses vers- via food web factors. So habitat, structures, communities, and some members of those communities can impose losses themselves. Predators, also influenced by that structure, can increase or decrease disease. Okay, so the idea is that factors changing habitat structure, like browning and warming, will change epidemic size in ways that we can predict if we think about the direct and indirect pathways. I have three more minutes. Okay, Um, good. So I have three more minutes, and that means I probably can't talk... So this, this sicker is sexier story is so awesome. Too bad that you're being mean and not letting me talk about it. Um, it's awesome. It involves, first of all, uh, Jessica, my student, being right about the mechanism. So lakes that have, that have larger epidemics are sexier, and that's because hosts allocate more to males. And she was right. And not because males are more resistant to infection. I was so wrong. Okay, but that's what all that was. Okay, because I could show you another example, and it's totally awesome. It would change your research program. But um, um, I'm gonna, I have to get past it. Sorry, people. Um, so, okay, I have like a couple minutes. Um, there are a bunch of traits that disease also mod- modulates. 
and I just want to introduce you to them, and I'll leave you with my parting thought. So, I, I, you just saw that awesome story about production of males. I always practice faster than I talk, and I can't remember that. Males allocate more, uh, so females allocate more to more male production when infected, and that has these implications for sex and possibly recombination and diversity. Ask me later if you want to hear about it. But also, feeding rate of hosts can, dep can be depressed, leading to, we've published our first few papers about hydro effects, so more hosts during epidemics of parasites that kill hosts. It's cool. Um, there's uh, examples of infectivity and fecundity creating trade-offs, leading to things like evolution of less resistance through a resistance is feudal mechanism that I think is just about to be accepted, and juvenile and adult mortality influenced by selective predation um, and parasites are inf influencing stage structure. But I'll come back sometime and tell you about that. Okay, so I have like a minute. Um, I wanted to introduce you to the idea that freshwater scientists could incorporate disease into its frameworks and be leaders. And I, and I, I did that by talking first about big picture, what are the key heterogeneities, and then I introduced you to a system which I'm tackling some of them. Um, insights from gains and losses, and there are all these other trait modifications that I couldn't tell you about. But I just want to leave you with a couple thoughts. So first, I think we can start to synthesize parasites into freshwater ecology, but I want to invite you to help me. Um, so I'll ask you this question. Um, are there parasites of key species that you study? I mean, I, I was a Daphne ecologist before I did this, and Daphne have all kinds of parasites. I, I, but they, I don't know how people didn't see them for so long. What are the major patterns of those parasite abundances can you identify the key heterogeneities yourself in the underlying natural history? They will help you build the modules that then clarify the major gains and losses. Then, this is the really cool part, I think, can you leverage all of this awesomeness from community ecology theory developed and popularized by freshwater ec ecologists to connect into parasites? If you can, you can build models to change species interactions calculate productions and fluxes in ways that I, I, I think we can really do. Okay, so calling all organismal ecologists, are you with me? Um, if you, so if you are, I just want to emphasize that I've been doing this for 20 years and I feel like I barely started and have accomplished nothing, so there's a lot of room. Aquatic systems are so tractable in ways that in, in terrestrial ones aren't, so let's use it. We can build natural history strengths. We can build on historic strengths in theory. Let's use it. Well, maybe these examples helped inspire you. Uh, even if not, <laughs> thanks for listening. Thank you. Spencer, I realize we have one more thing in common next to Bloomington, Daphne, and our love for parasites. Do you know what it is? The way you talk is exactly how I do my workout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, there you go. So, very efficient. Um, the <laughs> questions will be... <laughs> Questions will be taken during uh, coffee break. We okay. Don't have Sorry, I went long, people. Now. But I would like to re-invite Christiane and uh, Mark to the stage. And uh, please Perfect. come here. And we have some like small uh, thank you gifts uh, for you to thank you for all this like enthusiasm you shared with us during thank last you. two hours. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. One for Christiana too. Nobody knows what this is. Huh? <laughs> Oh, coffee break now. Take advantage of grabbing a parasite. Oh, oh sorry, a host. 